الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. We continue إن شاء الله with the discussion on the pre decree which is the sixth pillar of Islam of Iman and the question is is man endowed with a free will? Did you want to be in this room? Did you want to read such and such book by your own free will? Do you want to eat later? Do you want to go to bed when you feel sleepy? Sister Aisha, Addalu ala al-khayri kafa'ili The one who directs people to what's good is like the one who actualizes doing the good. So do you want to go to bed when you feel sleepy? When it's time to pray, do you go and make wudu? You make ablution? Do you choose the kind of a car you want to buy? And so forth. Do you choose the kind of car you want to buy? The actions done by a mature person are based upon his free will. He was a will, or he has a will, and he has an ability. Two things. If man has no free will, punishment on disobedience would be unjust. Alaykum as rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. For you. If man has no free will, punishment on disobedience would be unjust. Similarly, obedience would be in vain. So nay, but man has a choice. And his actions are foredained by Allah. And he, the Most High, does not compel him to act. We know that when man wanted to do something, and he was able to accomplish it, then Allah wanted to have it done. That's why Allah says in Surah at takwir chapter 81, verses 28 and 29, لِمَنْ شَاءَ مِنْكُمْ أَنْ يستقيم وَمَا تَشَاءُونَ إِلَّا يَشَاءَ اللَّهُ رَبُّ الْعَالَمِينَ To whomsoever among you who wills to walk straight and you will not unless it be that Allah wills. Had man been compelled, he would have no will or ability to act. But since man's will and ability are both part of his self and that the self is a creation of Allah, then man's choice does not escape the perfection of Allah's lordship, meaning nothing occurs in the heavens and the earth, but with Allah's permission, he wills it, or he did not will it. There are certain things that happen without man having any will or choice in them. There are certain things that happen without man having any will or choice in them. Such things are not attributed to man. For example, death, illness, being suddenly hit by a car. All such matters are purely attributed to the pre-decree. Man has no choice in them. Alaykum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So this covers this point. And this means that man has a free will and that his will and his ability are both part of his self. And we know that the self is a creation of Allah. Therefore, he will not be able to escape the lordship of Allah, which means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created everything and he runs the affairs of everything. So nothing occurs in the heavens and the earth but with Allah's permission. The other case now, why is it that Allah may want what he dislikes? If someone asks, how is it that Allah wants something yet he dislikes it? How can one understand such concept? We all know that there are many drug prescriptions disliked and hated for their smell and taste, yet when it is known that there is a cure in them, we take them and we love them for that. Traveling a long and difficult journey to achieve something desired and loved is another example. 
if it is known that a surgical removal of a diseased part of the body would save the rest of it, it is disliked and hated from one side and liked from another. So it is not contradictory to have love and hate combined in addressing one matter. This is true with the created being, with you and me. So what about Allah the Creator? whom there is nothing hidden from him and to whom belongs the perfect wisdom by all means is fitting to him he the exalted hates a matter in itself and on the other hand wants it because of its link to yet another matter or because it's a means that leads to something he loves in all of his actions Allah has the perfect wisdom we may recognize part of his wisdom or the general aspect of it, but not its complete details. One vivid case about this subject is the creation of Iblis, of Shaitan, the devil, who is the sponsor of every corruption and evil in the world. He is hated from one side, yet Allah wanted his creation, because he is a means for many beloved things to Allah, and that there is great wisdom behind his creation. And we talked about the wisdoms behind his creation from six angles that was uh, presented, that were presented by Imam Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, earlier in the talk. Similarly, there is wisdom behind the creation of calamities, sufferings, hardships, that speak about the favors of Allah, his justice and his mercy. Some of this wisdom includes the following tests for the believers in them there are tests for the believers in them there is training and strengthening of the believers faith in them there is an evidence for the weakness of man and his need for his Lord and that he has no success unless he humbles himself to his creator in them there is a way to expiate sins and an elevation to higher degrees in the sight of Allah that's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said مَا مِنْ شَيْءٍ يُصِيبُ الْمُؤْمِنَ حَتَّى الشَّوْكَةَ تُصِيبُهُ إِلَّا كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَهُ بِهَا حَسَنَةً أَوْ حُطَّتْ عَنْهُ بِهَا خَطِيئَةً There is nothing in the form of trouble that touches the believer even the pricking of a thorn except that Allah decrees a good for him or effaces one of his sins because of that. This is reported in Sahih Muslim. In the calamities and so forth, is in, there are means for receiving reward for both the ill-Muslim and the Muslim doctor in charge. There is witnessing the, the occurrence of favors and blessings after calamities and hardships. This has more profound effects and generates a meaningful and proper appreciation of Allah's power, wisdom, mercy and justice. He, the Most High, is to be praised on all of His decrees. There is an appreciation for good health and the well-being of oneself because of disease. A reminder about what is more devastating, which is hell. A lesson to remember and a build-up of eagerness for paradise. And many more wisdoms of which we may know or we may not know. And we cannot say, how did Allah allow this and prevent that? Nor how did He create this and how come He didn't create that? Nothing escapes His ability and nothing occurs in His kingdom except that He had willed it to occur. He owes us nothing. Allah owes us nothing. If He gives, then it's His favor. And if He, if he prevents, then it's His justice. If Allah puts a person under certain tests and trials and the person recognizes that he must resort to Allah alone seeking his help then this is a good sign for the, for the slave of Allah for the person the trials tend to purification and mercy however if on the other hand he rejects complains and turns away from Allah 
and results to human beings like him, then this is a bad sign for him. The trial stands to punishment and misery upon him. This is from the words of Imam Ibn al-Qayyim. Rahimahullah. So, inshallah, this answers this case. Now the case, the new case. <laughs> Why is it that Allah bestowed guidance on the believers and not the disbelievers? Why did he help the believer until he became a mu'min, a believing person, but did not help the disbeliever? First, claiming that it is unjust on the part of Allah to bestow guidance on the believers alone is false, because guidance is a favor from Allah. Listen to this. Guidance is a favor from Allah. Hear what he said about it, subhanahu wa ta'ala, in Surah Al-Hujurat, in chapter uh, 49. Verse 17 Nay, but Allah has conferred a favor upon you That he has guided you to the faith If you indeed are true Conferring the favor of iman, of faith To a particular person Is like conferring health, knowledge, beauty, wealth On another he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, conferred majestic and countless favors on all of his slaves. Had they spent their lives, their days and nights worshipping him, their worship would not be equivalent to a small portion of Allah's favor. That's why Allah permits people to paradise by the grace of his mercy and not by their deeds. Listen to this, now you'll be surprised about this, but inshallah wait and you see what it means. And I will repeat it, that's why Allah permits people to paradise by the grace of His mercy and not by His deeds. When He bestows guidance on some of His slaves, it is a matter that belongs completely to Allah and it cannot be considered as unjust. Their deeds, our deeds are means, means that lead to paradise, but not an exchange for it. I will write that down, inshallah. Our deeds are means that lead to paradise, but not an exchange. There's no trading here for it. Our deeds are means that lead to paradise, but not an exchange for it. But you may read in the Quran the following ayah. Inshallah. You may you know you may go to the Quran and find the following ayah. In forty three seventy two. Allah says وَتِلْكَ الْجَنَّةُ أُورِثْتُمُوهَا بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ this is the paradise which you have been made to inherit because of your deeds which you used to do in the life of this world. So, you're going to take this now, this ayah, and you may say, I can't understand it in the light of the Prophet when he said, in the light of the Prophet saying when he said, man can enter paradise through his good deeds. You see, the ayah is saying here, you will inherit because of your deeds. And the Prophet ﷺ is saying, man can enter paradise through his good deeds. The Prophet's companions even said, not even you, O oh Allah's Messenger, he said, not even myself, look at this now, look at this answer here, not even myself, unless Allah bestows his favors and mercy on me. This is in Sahih al-Bukhari, also by Muslim and others. So what is therefore the correct understanding regarding this verse and regarding this hadith? It's clear. The Prophet ﷺ here is saying, That's okay, sister. Not even myself, unless Allah bestows His favors on me. And he's saying, none can enter paradise through his good deeds. Yet Allah is saying, subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have been made to inherit it because of your deeds which you used to do in this life of this world. The answer by Imam Ibn al-Jawzi 
and Ibn al-Qayyim as follows. Number one, succeeding in doing righteous deeds is due to the mercy of Allah without which, without which there would have been no established faith and no obedience. This is the first thing. Succeeding in doing these righteous deeds is due to the mercy of Allah. And secondly, the mere entrance to paradise is due to Allah's mercy and that people are assigned to its different ranks according to their deeds. And thirdly, the deeds are not an exchange for paradise like in this world people say, I bought this for that. And acts of obedience are executed in a short period of time over the entire life of the person while the reward does not end. The reward does not end. The reward therefore is incomparable with the deeds of the person. It is the favor of Allah that really counts therefore. They are recognized, but they are executed in a short time over the entire life of the person while the reward does not end. Incomparable. They cannot be an exchange. And therefore, there is something increment. And this increment is the favor of Allah. He is the one who made tawfiq who made success for the person to indulge in doing the good deeds. That's why the Prophet now explains it in his statement when he said, not even myself, unless Allah bestows his favors and mercy on me. Meaning, on your own deeds, you don't really depend that they will enter your paradise without the mercy and tawfiq of Allah who led you to do these good things. It's the favor of Allah that counts. Secondly, so this is the first thing, that guidance is a favor from Allah. Injustice is the assignment of things to their unsuitable places, as we explained last night. And Allah Most High assigns punishment to its right place. Justly He had shown mankind all ways of guidance and established evidence upon them. So He is not unjust when He bestows the favor of faith on some of His slaves, but not on the others. So there is no injustice in this. Also Allah had established his hujjah, his proof, on all those whom he withheld from his guidance. He established evidence against them. He sent them the messengers, calling them to return to his path, provided them with all means that lead to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he did not set a barrier between them and the ways that lead to guidance. He did not, for example, hold the child and the mentally disabled responsible towards his command. Following the establishment of Allah's proofs and evidences, there is no room for any objection as to the bestowing of guidance on some of his slaves. Everything falls in place. Faith in the right place, and it is withheld from the wrong place. This is Allah's absolute justice. Then the second part of the question, why did Allah assist the believer and not the kafir? This question is false. Because number one, the reality of this question is like, why didn't Allah guide mankind? The question is baseless because there is a great wisdom behind creation in its own variations as we discussed last night. Some of this wisdom is to know is known to us and some is not known. In the course of the sections discussed earlier, the same issue was addressed and we answered that, the creation of contrast and everything. And that, how that is a manifestation of Allah's names and attributes. Secondly, Allah's aid is one of His actions. Don't be disheartened, the loose steps. Don't be disheartened by that. Allah's aid is one of His actions. Whatever he has done is due to a certain purpose. And whatever he has not done is because there is no purpose behind it. Obedience, however, is an act by man. The benefit goes to him. When Allah helps, obedience is an act by man. The benefit goes to him, to man. When Allah helps someone, it is his favor. And when he leaves him for himself, it is his justice. 
He showed the ways of guidance and established evidence on mankind. However, therefore comes to Allah, whoever therefore comes to Allah, believing in him and his messenger, Allah will come to his aid and enable him to achieve guidance. Those on the other hand who deny Allah, reject him and his messenger, and turn away from faith, Allah leaves them to themselves and will not guide them. وَأَمَّا ثَمُودُ فَهَدَيْنَاهُمْ فَاسْتَحَبُّ الْعَمَى عَلَى الْهُدَى And as for Thamud, the tribe of Prophet Salih, And as for Thamud, the tribe of Prophet Salih, we showed them and made clear to them the path of truth of Tawheed through our messenger. We showed them the way of success, but they preferred blindness to guidance. They preferred blindness to guidance. This is chapter 41, verse 17. They preferred blindness to guidance, and that brought the wrath of Allah upon them. When Allah calls his slave to know about him, to love him, to remember him and give thanks to him, but the slave chooses to reject and turns away from Allah, he takes him out by sealing his heart and keeping him away from faith, setting a barrier between his heart and his guidance. That's his justice and that's what he said in the Quran, 61 verse 15. So when they turned away from the path of Allah, Allah turned their hearts away from the right path and Allah guides not the people who are rebellious and disobedient to Him. The existing causes behind the turning of their hearts are muqaddara, meaning Allah knew them, wrote them, created them and willed them. And they are committed by their choice, will and action. And after Allah had shown His signs and ways that lead to Him, so the punishment inflicted upon them is just, is a just decree. His justice is illustrated in the saying of the Prophet ﷺ in his invocation, مَاضٍ فِيَّ حُكْمُكْ عَدْلٌ فِيَّ قَضَاءُكْ Your judgment is continuously being carried upon me. Your qada, your sentence upon me is just. This hadith is reported by Imam Ahmed and others. And al-Sheikh al-Albani, uh, rahimahullah, authenticated it. Also, Imam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah said, Alaykum as salam rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh, fame 75, Allah made known what is beneficial for the life of this world and for the hereafter. Allah made known what is beneficial for the lives of this world and for the hereafter. So when man is able to recognize the good from the bad, he must be humble and submit himself to Allah so that Allah can assist him to do what is beneficial. Man should not say, well, I will not do this or that until Allah creates in me what I should do. Certainly if he is attacked by an enemy or a beast, he would not say, I will wait until Allah creates in me the act of fleeing. It is within the characteristics of fitra, of the natural inclination, that it likes what it needs and rids itself from harm and asks for Allah's support. It is against the fitra to say, I am not going to eat and drink until Allah creates this willing in me. Naturally, you want to eat and drink and ask Allah to make it easy for you. Asking for Allah's aid is necessitated by the fitra. And that's why Allah commanded His slaves to ask for His help in carrying on His decrees. Allah created man as well as the ability to believe. If you want to believe, then you would do it. If you don't, then you don't want to believe. Not because of your inability. Your ability exists. So don't say to the messenger, ask Allah to make me want to believe. Indeed, if you request this, then it means that you want to believe. <laughs> 
But if you do not request this, then you lie in your saying, let him take me want to believe, let him make me want to believe. Whoever wants to obey, then he firmly does so. Because the firm will, the firm will together with the existing ability, necessitate obedience. And whoever does not want to obey, he does not do so. And will not request that the messenger asks Allah to create it in him. A man may order others in order to gain a benefit for himself. Example, a king orders his soldiers to support his kingdom. He should give them the proper aid to produce the benefit he seeks. This is one kind of aid. The other kind is when the person giving the command sees that the assistance to the recipient of his command is of benefit to him, and thus he comes to his aid. Example, the person who enjoys what is right assists the Muslim on doing righteous deeds, knowing that Allah will reward him on his assistance. There remains one case. The command is issued in order to benefit its recipient without actually assisting him in carrying it out. For example, a doctor orders the patient to take certain medicine. He does not have to assist him in taking it. The mufti, the learned scholar who is able to, do, to give religious verdicts, does not have to assist the person requesting a fatwa, requesting a religious decree, the verdict. Similarly, in consultations about agriculture or marriage, the consultant does not have to assist in carrying out the consultation. It is known that the person who does not assist in carrying out what he commands or advises is not considered foolish or stupid. The man who came to the Prophet Musa السلام, asking him to leave Egypt because the Pharaoh and his staff were plotting to kill him did so because it was in his interest to see that the Prophet of Allah Musa safe. It was not in his interest to help Moses leave because of the harm he may receive from the Pharaoh and his people. If such matters are possible on the human level, is it not more proper that Allah, whom there is nothing like unto him in himself and his attributes and actions, is all qualified in his decisive wisdom as far as who may or may not receive his help? He, Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and on the tongue of his messengers, ordered his creation to execute what benefits them, and forbade what is harmful to them. Some of them obeyed, and he helped them, and some he did not help. It is not incumbent upon him that he must help them when he commands them. For example, it is certain that jihad, striving for the cause of Allah, for the cause of Allah is an act of obedience. But when Allah knew that there is evil associated with the sharing of the hypocrites in jihad with the Prophet ﷺ, he did not help them. In fact, he said, وَلَوْ أَرَادُوا الْخُرُوجَ لَأَعَدُّوا لَهُ عُدَّةً وَلَكِنْ كَرِهَ اللَّهُمْ بِعَاثَهُمْ فَثَبَّطَهُمْ وَقِيلَ قَعُدُوا مَعَ الْقَاعِدِينَ لَوْ خَرَجُوا فِيكُمْ مَا زَادُوكُمْ إِلَّا خَبَالًا وَلَأَوْضَعُوا خِلَالَكُمْ يَبْغُونَكُمْ الْفِتْنَةِ وَفِيكُمْ سَمَّاعُونَ لَهُمْ وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ بِالظَّالِمِينَ In chapter 9, verse 47, And if they had intended, and if they had intended to march out, certainly they would have made some preparations for it. But Allah was averse to their being sent forth. So He made them lag behind. And it was said to them, Sit you among those who sit at home. Had they marched out with you, they would have added nothing to you except disorder, and they would have hurried about in your midst, spreading corruption and sowing sedition among you, and there are some among you who would have <coughs> listened to them. And Allah is all knower regarding the politicians and the wrongdoers. So it's clear, therefore, that it is not necessary when Allah commands his bondsmen with a decree which is beneficial to them that he will assist them on carrying it out. It is not incumbent upon him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And furthermore, 
let's not forget as we said earlier that the matter of the pre-decree is the secret of Allah and his creation he did not reveal it to a close angel nor to a prophet messenger we believe in the great wisdom of Allah in his creation and we do not question him on anything لا يسأل عما يفعل وهم يسألون he cannot be questioned as to what he does while they will be questioned as in the Quran Surah Al-Anbiya 21 verse 23 certainly if a matter is not clear to us it doesn't mean that there is no wisdom behind its occurrence always there is a wisdom behind everything that Allah creates or does not create alaykum as salam rahmatullahi wa barakatuh he is the all wise he is the all wise his wisdom is not to make all of his wisdom known to us subhanallah he is the all wise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his wisdom is not to make all of his wisdom known to us when it is considered fo- when it is considered foolishness that a person reveals everything he knows to others then it is all fitting to Allah the exalted and most perfect is it really fitting to reveal everything? The next question. Why does Allah punish the disobedient? We are explaining, uh, brother, the sixth pillar of Iman, and that is the pre-decree. Why does Allah punish the disobedient when he had preordained disobedience? This is a question. When a person commits a wrongdoing, no one puts the sword in front of his face and orders him to commit it. He does it by his choice. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about man, إِنَّا هَدَيْنَاهُ السَّبِيلَ إِمَّا شَاكِرًا وَإِمَّا كَفُورًا Verily we had showed him man the way, whether he be grateful or ungrateful. Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has shown both the grateful and ungrateful. Showed them the right way and made it clear as well. Of mankind, however, there are those who chose the right way and those who don't. Implicitly, we may tell the person that if someone offers you two worldly projects, one of them seems good, while you see that the other may cause evil to yourself, it is obvious that you choose the good project and you do not choose the evil one. And do you say that the pre-decree imposed it upon you? It is therefore incumbent upon you to take the same approach when you deal with the matters of the hereafter. Allah has set for you two projects actions that contradict his laws and thus lead to evil and actions that do not contradict his laws and lead to righteousness and a good outcome so why don't you choose for the hereafter what you choose for the life of this world we are we all are ignorant about what Allah had preordained for us we don't know what he had preordained for us Allah says, وَمَا تَدْرِي نَفْسٌ مَادَ تَكْسِبُ غَدَى In chapter 31, verse 34. And no person knows what he will earn tomorrow. And no person knows what he will earn tomorrow. Certainly when the person is about to do something, he proceeds based upon his own choice without any knowledge that Allah had preordained it and imposed upon him this is this is known uh, uh, wrong verse uh, uh, chapter Luqman verse 34 chapter Luqman uh, is it Luqman 25 That's the Furqan, no. Uh, Luqman 31 and verse 34. Uh, 
Yes, it is the right verse. Chapter 31, verse 34. So certainly when the person is about to do something, he proceeds based upon his own choice. Oh, okay, no problem. Without any knowledge that Allah had preordained this upon him or imposed it upon him. That's why some scholars said that the pre-decree is a sealed secret. Not all of us know that Allah had decreed such and such until it's actually manifested. Only then can we say that Allah had preordained it such and such of me. Of course, not blaming the pre-decree for our decree, for our deeds, for our deeds. In this regard, a story about Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, relates that when he wanted to cut the hand of a thief for theft, the thief said, wait, ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, O commander of the faithful, wait. By Allah, I didn't steal except by the pre-decree of Allah, meaning he blamed it on the pre-decree of Allah. Umar replied, and we will cut your hand only by the pre-decree of Allah. Thus Umar established evidence against the excuse of this thief. Of course Umar could have established evidence by both the judicial will, because he is commanded to cut the hand of the thief, and by the universal will of Allah. Therefore, no one has the right to take the pre-decree as an excuse for committing sin. In fact, there is no excuse in it. Allah the Most High says, رُسُلًا مُبَشِّرِينَ وَمُنْذِرِينَ لِأَلَّا يَكُونَ لِلنَّاسِ عَلَى اللَّهِ حُجَّةٌ بَعْدَ الرُّسُلِ As in this great verse in chapter 4, verse 165, messengers as bearer of good news as well as of warning, in order that mankind shall have no plea against Allah after the messengers. Also, Allah says in another verse, لِأَلَّا يَكُونَ لِلنَّاسِ عَلَى اللَّهِ حُجَّةٌ بَعْدَ الرُّسُلِ In order that mankind shall have no plea against Allah after the messengers. The same meaning of the same verse. Had the pre-decree of Allah been a valid excuse, it would never be eliminated, even after the sending of the messengers. Allahu Akbar. I will repeat. Had the pre-decree of Allah been a valid excuse, it would never be eliminated, even after the sending of the messengers. Hence, there is no excuse for this, the disobedient, the sinful in the pre-decree, because he is not compelled to commit acts of obedience, and Allah is the one who guides for success. These are from the words of our Shaykh Muhammad bin Salih al Uthaymin rahimahullah ta'ala. Allah has bestowed many great favors on his slaves, including the disobedient. Two of these great favors are, number one, the creation of mankind on fitrah, on Islam. As the Prophet explained in the saying, no child is born except on fitrah, on Islam. It is his parents who make him a Jew or a Christian. If the self is left on its fitrah, on its course, nothing will influence its love and worship of Allah, and it will not fall in shirk, or deny the Lordship of Allah. However, all of that may change if it associates itself with the devil from humans or jinn, causing it to deviate from the true guidance. Secondly, the general guidance of Allah to mankind, whereby He provided knowledge, sent messengers and books, and established evidence that He is the true and only God worthy of being worshipped. He showed the ways of guidance and called man to hold to them. When man turns away from them, then it is because he wanted and chose not to follow the path of guidance. Thus he is held accountable for his obedience and rejection. Thirdly, acts of obedience and disobedience come from the slave himself. They are executed by him and occur because of his will and ability. He is actively described and judged by his deeds. Nevertheless, his deeds are created by Allah. They are created by Allah, but not executed by Allah. It is known that whatever Allah creates is separately distinct from him. He does not carry the qualities or, f or perform the functions of what he creates.
So, man's deeds are created by Allah, and that does not contradict the fact that they are actions of the slave himself. So whoever commits acts of disobedience, then he has done them by his own choice. He turned away from guidance and proceeded towards disobedience, preferring it above obedience. Now if he says that disobedience was written and already recorded for me, then why do you blame me? It will be said to him, prayer to your actual exercise of sin, did you know that they were ordained for you? What makes you know about what Allah knows? Certainly, you don't know. Therefore, since you have a choice and will and ability, and because the ways of good and bad has been clarified, then if you commit sin, it means that you have chosen it and preferred it over obedience. You are responsible for the outcome and for the assigned and just punishment by Allah, and you have absolutely no excuse whatsoever. Allah the Exalted in you and wrote that such and such person is going to commit such a sin. Certainly this is going to happen exactly as Allah had preordained. Does he deserve punishment just because it's a matter preordained? Or is that Allah does not inflict punishment until after committing the wrong? Or are both matters the same? Certainly if inflicted, Punishment occurs after committing wrong deeds. Therefore, the blaming of pre-decree is not justified. Allah knew all about those who will commit wrong deeds before they actually commit them. He does not punish them because of His foreknowledge about them. He sent them the messages and the books as guidance, as well as to oblige, establish evidence, lest they say, how come you punish us only because of your knowledge about us when we didn't even think about committing wrong? Allah is just. And their arguments are only excuses. Why do they not ask the second part of the question, which is, if acts of obedience are preordained, then why does Allah grant reward on them? Finally, it's obvious that punishment for disobedience occurs because man commits it by his own choice and will, and he is not punished on anything that is not done according to his choice. So, inshallah, this covers the uh, section for tonight. And in it, alhamdulillah, we have covered these cases. Is man endowed with a free will? Why is it that Allah may want what he dislikes? And if, or why is it that Allah bestowed guidance on the believers and not the disbelievers? And why did he help the believer until he became a believing person, but not, did not help the disbeliever? And why does Allah punish the disobedient when he had preordained disobedience? Wa iyakum wa barakallahu fikum wa jazakum Allahu khair wa alhamdulillah rabbil alamin wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.